Um, Siraj and I uh, met each other at the last KubeCon, and um, we were both talking about the sort of technologies we were interested in and we'd been working on, um, and we decided we were a really good idea to sort of work out how we could bring these two projects together. So in the space of the last several months, I guess we've been educating each other on these respective CNCF projects. And um, here we are today. So thanks to the CNCF, thanks for coming. Uh, hopefully we can sort of enlighten you uh, as to what these projects are all about and potentially how you can combine them. Uh, just briefly about me, um, that's me, yep. <laughs> um, I'm Matt Bates, I'm a founder at a company called Cofide. It's a very early stage startup. Uh, we're focused on workload identity. Uh, so a multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. Uh, and I've previously uh, been involved uh, with a company called JetSack, and we worked on a project called Cert Manager. So identity is something that's very dear to my heart, and we've been doing for, uh, been doing for quite some time. Siraj? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Can people hear Maybe. me? OK. Uh, I might Hi, I'm uh, Suraj. I work for Microsoft, and uh, I'm working on the Confidential Containers uh, Upstream project. Thanks, we're gonna remain close to the mic so you can all hear us, okay. Um, okay, so just to um, introduce both of the projects, we're gonna look at both in turn. So hopefully, uh, this is a good opportunity to learn a bit more about the projects. Just a first, a show of hands, there's bright lights, so I might not see you all, but um, if you can just give us a show of hands for anyone that's heard of Spiffy and Spire. Ah, great, okay, that's, that's good. Um, and in a second show of hands for those of you that have used Oh, are using, but um, more to the point, uh, Spiffy Inspire in production. Okay, fewer hands. Um, we'd love to speak to you uh, at some point and learn, learn more about it. But for those of you who don't know, this is great. You're hopefully in the right place. And for the purpose of the next 10 minutes, uh, we're going to let you know a bit more about uh, what, what Spiffy is. So Spiffy is uh, Inspire. They are a CNCF graduated project. They've been around a long time. Uh, obviously, a number of you are aware of the project, um, probably for various reasons. But Spiffy itself uh, is a secure production identity framework for everyone. So the purpose of this is it's a framework, it's a set of APIs, it's a set of interfaces, all open uh, for basically provisioning uh, and validating identity for software systems. So if you're wanting to provide you know, a consistent way of being able to identify software, this is a really good set of standards. Um, and these have been adopted uh, throughout the sort of CN. CF ecosystem in various different projects. Um, we've got various different aspects to this, and I'll go through each in turn, uh, just very briefly. Um, so the Spiffy ID is a way of basically being able to identify um, you know, the service. So how do you actually represent the service um, in an identity? So there's a way that in the Spiffy project that, that, um, that that's proposed, um, and that's actually used by various different projects. So for instance, if you look under the hood um, in Istio, uh, you will see that yeah, Istio uses uh, the Spiffy ID. The SVID, uh, the Spiffy uh, Verifiable ID, um, is actually a sort of an identity document. So this is like how you would actually represent this cryptographically. Uh, and in Spiffy and Inspire, as we'll see, um, you can represent this as an like, X509 uh, certificate, um, or you can use a JWT token. But this is really about like, actually putting it into a cryptographic form and then providing it um, to a workload. The way that you obtain the identity um, is via the, the workload API. This is a way that workloads, your applications, your services um, can obtain identity. And interestingly, it does so in a way that's sort of authentication-less. It does not have to authenticate. So the workload API uh, is a node local API. We'll see this uh, soon in the architecture. But the way of doing this is like through a process of attestation. It doesn't have to have some token provided beforehand. It can actually provide some evidence about itself. Um, so the workload API runs on the agent, on the node. We'll see this in a little while. Um, we've also got a Spiffy Trust Bundle. This is a way about how you would represent the, uh, the public keys uh, effectively in the PKI hierarchy. So when you want to basically be able to validate trust, um, that's the way that the, the, the Trust Bundle gets represented. And we've also got this thing called Spiffy Federation. So if you wish to be able to federate different environments, different trust domains together, um, there's a way uh, for that uh, trust to be, you know, the roots to be exchanged and trust to be established. So really, what we're going to look at now is the Spire. So Spire is the reference implementation. So Spiffy, the framework, uh, Spire, uh, the reference architecture. And Spire is used by a number of very large end users um, that contribute to the, to the community. So for instance, Uber, TikTok, just to, just to name a couple, um, use um, Spire in production. And obviously, some of you here in the audience do too. Um, so really just kind of distilling this down and keeping things rather simple for the purposes of today's talk, 
Um, effectively, we've got you know, two components, or three components, I guess, if you will. Um, we've got the Spire server. Um, this is responsible, basically, for managing um, and uh, valid, yeah, actually providing identity, uh, pretty much. And it's backed by a data store. Um, so we need to basically register uh, things up front, so it's re your responsibility or perhaps through some automation to register your workload with Spire server. And you do so using sort of a set of registration entries, uh, effectively you know, attributes that describe um, your workload and where, where you expect the workload to be and how you expect the workload to present itself. So that all gets stored in a, in a, in a, in a data store, uh, pretty much. We've then got these agents that work on each of the nodes, and the nodes can be, you know, they can be running in Kubernetes, they can also be running outside of it. And I think the, the, the everyone aspect of this is important. This Spiffy is all about providing identity to all manner of different software systems, whether it's in cloud um, or on-premise. So this is your way of providing a very consistent way of doing this. So yeah, let's imagine this could also run you know, in bare metal as well as, of course, in a, in, in a cluster. Now, this agent is basically uh, responsible for, for running the, this workload API, uh, so it implements that workload API specification. And workloads themselves talk to the agent, this being a node local API. And rather than actually having to present some kind of token, um, they, this is sort of an unauthenticated API. It runs locally uh, on the host itself. Um, it actually pro provides, uh, kind of discovers information uh, about the process. If you're running on Linux, as an example, what will happen here um, is you know, the agent will basically introspect the, the Linux kernel. It'll discover information about the process. Um, it'll find attributes and information. It'll maybe consult, for instance, the container runtime. It might speak to the kubelet uh, that's also running on that node. Uh, and it'll set a, find a set of information that it will use and it will attest. And that, all of those attributes get provided you know, up through the API to the server, and ultimately that gets compared to what was pre-registered. The idea being is, you know, you're validating whether this workload is valid and should be where it is, um, and whether it should be granted identity. That's pretty much the flow here. The important thing is the agent's doing it for you. It's pretty transparent, um, and the workload itself does not have to do that whole dance around obtaining identity, rotating it, um, and, and all, of, all of that kind of uh, difficulty. So that's pretty much how, how these things work. It's probably also worth noting there is also a process of node attestation as well. So it's not just about the workload itself, the testing itself, but it's also about the node. And so you may wish um, to uh, you know, validate, for instance, that it's running on a valid yeah, yeah, a cloud instance, as an example. Maybe perhaps you might want to go down to the level of the hardware, maybe consult things like the TPM. And there's a variety of different plugins in the Spire project for enabling you to do this. So you can just plug in uh, to, to, the, uh, to the ecosystem uh, pretty much and use all of those different plugins. So that's kind of really how things effectively look at, uh, at a high level um, in Spire. Why would you do this? You're probably asking, you're probably thinking, okay, you know, I've set up all of this infrastructure. Effectively, what this enables you to provide um, is a set of like cryptographic documents, so X509 certificates that you can then use in your services to establish something like a mutual TLS uh, connection. Uh, and obviously this could be within a cluster, this could be outside a cluster, this could be, uh, yeah, pretty heterogeneous environments, uh, pretty much. And so in this example here, you've got an example, you can actually see the SVID and how the Spiffy ID uh, is represented. Um, so it encodes information about the service, it includes things like the pod name, the namespace, and again, if you've used something like Istio or some of the other service meshes, you'll probably recognize um, that sort of uh, encoding. Uh, of detail um, in the Spiffy ID. Um, so obviously we can sort of use these certificates, and this example actually shows Envoy. So if you wanted, you might not want to do it yourself. Um, you can, if you wish, consult and use the workload API directly. There's a set of language bindings to do that. Um, there's a set of helper projects to make it easier where you can actually be provided it as a set of files that you can consume in your application. There's a CSI Spiffy, a CSI driver that you can use. Um, or you can use the Envoy integration here as well. So you can have the support of SDS, and Envoy will do the magic, of course, of providing you the mutual TLS connection using those, um, those uh, certificates. So really what we want to focus on is, is the security of this. So obviously, you know, going back to the architecture here, you can see we've got Spire server. It's responsible for managing identities. It's responsible for issuing them. Uh, and so as part of that, of course, it has sensitive signing keys. Um, ultimately, this is all backed by PKI. Uh, and so that's why a server uh, is clearly very sensitive. And you 
you know, have to do everything you can, can to protect it. So referring here to the Solving the Bottom Turtle book, which I'd highly recommend you read. It's, it, it's a great read on everything Spiffy Spire and the motivations for the project and the various ways that you can use it. Um, so we're quoting here and there's some links that you can follow. But really it's very important, obviously, to run something like Spire Server um, in an isolated kind of way. Now, you don't really want this particularly to run um, in a sort of multi-tenanted cluster. Effectively, in the threat model, workloads are untrusted. Um, and so therefore, you do not want to have workloads running in the same place as the Spire server, which hopefully makes a lot of sense, uh, pretty obvious. Um, so yeah, first, really good practice is to make sure that you run Spire server on an isolated node. And that could well be you know, a separate node pool, or indeed, you might even want to run it on a server instance that runs outside the cluster. So that's certainly, certainly number one. And you know, obviously, there's some quotes here from uh, the book and recommend you uh, take a sort of further read. Um, so as I said, managing and issuing identities, um, really sensitive component. But and obviously, in, in the Spire server, we've got really sensitive uh, keys. And all of these, the signing operations take place in the Spire server. So what we wanted to consider um, when we were chatting at the last KubeCon is, OK, we've got this sensitive component. How about we employ um, some further protection? You, we kind of think about things with defense and depth in mind. And so effectively, if you think of the Spire server and what it's doing, um, uh, the fact is it, you know, by default anyway, has unencrypted memory. So all of these signing operations, the keys themselves, for the issuing authority um, are in plain text. So you know, if someone had access, a bad actor had access to the node, in which the spy server is running, they could, strictly speaking, get access to that. Uh, and um, yeah, really, at that point, of course, it's game over. You've compromised the entire trust domain, and they can start sort of minting certificates and impersonating services um, in that trust domain. So what we wanted to consider is like this, this, this attack vector. So at that point, I think it's probably a good time to hand over to Raj. He's going to talk about confidential compute. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt, for the introduction of Spire and Spire Server and uh, how like it's a single point of failure, uh, depending on how you how you configure it. So uh, let's talk about what confidential compute is. But we'll we'll take a sidebar on what the current state of data protection today is. Right. So when uh, data is stored on disks, it's uh, encrypted. It's uh, when it's on network, it's encrypted. You have, I mean, solutions for both of these problems. But when, but when you are processing it uh, in in memory, the data when it's brought in memory, it's it stays there unencrypted, right? So that's what confidential compute tries to solve. This this third aspect, this third leg of data protection, that's what confidential containers uh, or confidential compute brings in. So it's like a Spire's uh, or Spiff's uh, logo, the stool. So you get like a third, uh, third leg there. So uh, what is confidential compute? You, it's a processor technology backed by AMD, uh, Intel, ARM. Uh, it's, 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 it's within the processor. It creates a secure enclave. And uh, this enclave could be a VM or a process. The, within the enclave, or that enclave's memory is protected as an encrypted processor knows how to encrypt and decrypt that memory. <clears throat> and finally, like it's the, that's the whole thing, like memory protection. So within the enclave, that application doesn't care about. It's all transparent. Within the enclave, it's it's all plain text, like regular application uh, would work. So uh, why confidential compute, right? So there are a lot of like uh, rising security concerns around, uh, you know, containerized applications. Then uh, you know you want comprehensive data protection, like we talked about the third thing about memory protection, and ad adherence to privacy regulations, like especially here uh, in Europe, where uh, the data protection uh, laws are pretty stringent. You'd want your uh, data in use to be uh, protected or encrypted. So uh, let's start with like talking about like uh, the usual trusted compute base, right? So in traditionally you are trusting the hardware, the BIOS firmware, the uh, the host operating system, the hypervisor, and the guest. But with confidential compute, you only trust the uh, underlying hardware, and everything in between, you can stop trusting. So that's that's what confidential compute is giving you. It's it's reducing your trusted compute base. So that way you have smaller attack surface. And that's uh, that's that's uh, yeah, that, yeah that's what you get. 
So w what are the target audience, right? So first is like uh, anybody dealing with uh, PII data, healthcare, businesses, uh, or like financial businesses, governments, etc. And uh, yeah, so anything that needs, so basically you can think of anybody who is running on an untrusted infrastructure and they need higher security. You don't know who is, who has access to the underlying host, even if, I mean, even if somebody promises they won't do any illegal stuff, but you don't know these organizations are big, right? So uh, yeah, any, uh, any, anybody with sensitive data for that matter. So uh, let's see what confidential containers is, right? It's a, it's an open source uh, CNCF sandbox project. Uh, the whole idea of confidential containers is that this technology enabled by uh, chip makers, uh, we want to bring it to Kubernetes. Like every pod that you could, that you want to process sensitive data in, should be backed by encrypted memory. So l let's take a look like how it how it works in general. So I think uh, most of you are familiar with this uh, Kubernetes uh, diagram, block diagram. There is control plane on the left, and then there are a bunch of nodes. Each node has a kubelet as an agent, which is responsible for bringing up your uh, workloads. So we'll, we'll zoom into the node here. So the typical interaction uh, that happens is kubelet gets a request. It passes to container D, and then it uses run C to start a pod. This is, this is the usual. But with uh, confidential containers, we use a runtime called as Kata. Who, who has heard of Kata containers here? Oh, a lot of hands. OK, so uh, it, a two-liner uh, for Kata is that instead of using run C, it, uh, Kata uses lightweight VMs to start startup ports. So uh, this, is, this is the same interaction with Kata. There's kubelet, container D. But instead of runs, it's Kata runtime, which knows how to talk to the underlying virtualization technology. It brings up the VM. There is Kata agent. It's a PID one. That's where it is interacting with the external Kata runtime. And the pod comes up, and then that's how, that's how you have it there. But with Kata confidential uh, containers, uh, what you need is a hardware that can bring up, which is, which is capable of running confidential compute uh, uh, TEs. So, uh, OK. Oops, hold on. I think I messed up. <laughs> uh, OK, anyways, never mind. So uh, with T, like what you get uh, here is uh, there is there's kubelet. Uh, the same container D, and then, oh, okay, it's switched. <laughs> okay. So what I'll do is I'll move this here, and yeah. Hmm. OK, that's what happened. OK, <laughs> okay we are learning here. All right, so uh, it's, it's Kata CC. Uh, you have this hardware that can, OK, yeah, it's, it's working now. So <laughs> it's, it's Kubelet, it's Kata runtime, uh, same thing, KVM, virtual machine comes up, uh, Kata agent exists. But there is another uh, set of components that you need, which does attestation. So remote attestation is a, is a big part of uh, using confidential com compute or confidential containers. Because you want to ensure that you are running on a confidential hardware. Because underlying hardware provider can you know, lie about it. They can be like, yeah, this is a confidential VM. But how, how, are, how, how can you be sure? So that's where this attestation process comes in. These components that are part of the Kata VM, they talk to the hardware create an evidence, send it to an external party. This party is, or here we call it relying party. It's, it's, it's your infrastructure where you can do verification. Now this verification involves like, uh, you, you, you see this evidence that you got. Is it really signed by AMD or Intel's hardware? So once, once that attestation passes, now it, I mean, that's the basic thing you do. But you can also see like, if, it's the, if the kernel is correct, the initRD is fine, the kernel parameters are. Uh, so you're ensuring that inside that VM, everything that you see is what you expected. 
And if anything is, anything is different, you just don't pass the attestation, right? Now, what happens after attestation is, is, is successful is up to you. You can just be an acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement, or you can release a key or a policy or whatever it is. In this case, what we're doing is we're releasing a key. Now, this key is actually used to encrypt and container image. So we download this encrypted container image, decrypt it, and a pod is started. So now you can use this uh, encrypted container image if you want to protect your IP if the, or the application. But if the application is not so sensitive, you can release something like uh, a, a secret to download something from other cloud or other sources or whatever it could be, right? So moving on. So the Cocoa Threat model here is that it's, uh, it, it promises two things, confidentiality and integrity. Confidentiality because anything outside the TE cannot see what's inside. And integrity because you have done this remote attestation, you are ensuring everything that you expected is, is, is as is. Um, and the other thing that we assume for, from the confidential containers point of view is that anything outside that pod, even the worker node, is untrusted. The Kubernetes control plane is untrusted. Everything outside that thing inside the cluster is untrusted. That's, that's, uh, that's what we uh, go with. So there is this basic demo here. Here I show like how you can start a pod, read, read its memory, and basically anything, any secret that you have gotten, you could see. Uh, I won't go through this demo here because, uh, yeah, we don't have enough time, but I have another demo that I'll show at the end. But yeah, go check out uh, this demo when you, when you have time. So uh, yeah, so let's, let's talk about how uh, Confidential Containers Inspire uh, comes in. I'll hand over to Matt here. Thanks. No, it was great to hear about the, the, the Cocoa project. So what we thought about is like how potentially you could take these two projects and um, yeah, take, take the best of both, as, as it were. Um, and so we, uh, with, with the Spire server in mind, we're going to focus on primarily Spire server um, at this stage. And there's some scope for also you know, potentially putting the enclave, um, the agents right into the enclave. Uh, how we're going to focus on the server um, is there is real interest in wanting to protect the core signing keys. And there's a, a recent quote here from somebody at Microsoft. You know, this is yeah, post-breach. And uh, they're thinking about how to you know, obviously secure things going forward. Um, they've sort of noted that they want to be able to put yeah, identity signing keys, so obviously very sensitive. Um, into both HSMs and use confidential computing. Now it's sort of more, you know, more, more sort of widely available. Um, so with that kind of in mind, um, how could Spire benefit from this? So what we thought is, yeah, okay, yeah, taking that defense in depth approach um, and Coco providing the means now to encrypt memory, um, could we take the two and sort of protect uh, the data in use? So as that signing uh, happens, yeah, can we protect against anyone? hostile that may want to see that operation and obviously exfiltrate the keys. Um, and so this, this is really kind of what we sort of set out to do. And I think we now do have a demo, which we're going to run. Uh, it's not live, but it's pre-recorded. So we're going to uh, take a look at Spire server running in Coco. OK. OK, so this is the demo. It's a, it's a single node Kubernetes cluster. Um, we, uh, we can see in the confidential containers uh, this namespace that the confidential con uh, containers operator has installed a bunch of things. And once the operator uh, is up and running, it creates a bunch of runtime classes. That's the, that's the interface for other applications to use confidential containers. Uh, so there is Kata, Kata QME, SNP, uh, all of that. Now, what we'll do is uh, we we'll go to the worker node. And uh, we can verify this is really a SCV SNP enabled uh, machine. So this SCV SNP is AMD's, uh, AMD's confidential compute technology. So uh, we'll, let's install uh, Spire uh, with, with Spire ser uh, CRDs first, and then the Spire server. This, this is like without any modification, like regular uh, Spire uh, thing. Uh, although, I mean, have made some modifications here, like for persistence, what I have done is uh, chosen to use like emptyDir with uh, memory as a backend and like not you relying on the default. And then uh, there is data store, there is a SQL data store behind the scene. And yeah, the key manager is also uh, in memory. So yeah, let's, uh, let's see if the ports are up, it's, it's, it's up and running. 
let's see, there is, there is no runtime class or anything information. This is regular run C based uh, thing. We can see from the, uh, from the logs that it's, it's, it's up and running. Uh, it has issued a bunch of SVIDs. Now, yeah, let's uh, also register the agent and also the client. Now, the, 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 this is from the document, uh, like the regular quick start uh, thing, right, if, if you are aware of the Spire. This, this has nothing uh, different, it's just the, the, the socket, is, uh, socket is changed and we'll try to talk to the, the local agent. The client is deployed and yeah, it's the same socket path and everything. And yeah, uh, SVID is issued. Now, the, the, this is the regular thing that you would, you would show anywhere, anybody when you're showing Spire. But let's look at the Spire server here, right? Like on the worker node, let's get the PID. Uh, what we'll do is we'll do a core dump of this uh, PID. And once we have this core file, we can look at, uh, look at its uh, ASCII representation. So we can search for stuff like X509 search and and like uh, private key, for example, and stuff like that. So basically, this is just to show that, like on a regular uh, machine, you can uh, you can really see uh, what's in memory, and uh, yeah, it's 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 not that hard. If somebody has access to the host, yes, uh, they can do whatever. Now uh, the same thing we'll do again, but this time around we'll use uh, a runtime uh, like the the runtime class called uh, Kata Kiyomi SNP. So the diff from the values file, like I can show you here. Uh, the interesting part is this runtime class. That's the only thing that's, that's changed. Now you can see the Spire server is deployed. And this time it has a runtime class name as, as the value. And it's, yeah, looking at the logs, uh, it has started issuing SVIDs and everything. So just ensuring it's working. <laughs> Uh, we do the uh, registration of agent and uh, client. Same uh, client file, like nothing has changed here. And the client is deployed. And we can see that the SVDs are issued. Now again, uh, this time around, we go and find where the Spire server is. But we are not looking for Spire server. We are looking for QMU because it's running in a VM. Uh, we get the PID for this uh, VM. Store it in the ENV war, uh, do core dump, look for this, uh, look at this core file. Uh, there's no X509, there is no private key. And, and it's, it's not like the file is empty. Uh, it has a bunch of stuff, it's just that it's not, uh, it's not relevant. So yeah, uh, that was the demo. Now, moving on. So uh, like you, you would argue, right? Like there are limitations to this demo, like the DB uh, coexist with the server, or even the server is running on Kubernetes. So that's the point of this whole talk, right? You can still, you can run Spire uh, with on, on Kubernetes, but with encrypted memory. And like the DB coexists with the server, so you could use a highly available database, but then the database has to be uh, like you could use a hosted service for this database, but then is that hosted service running on a confidential compute hardware? Because depending on what kind of sensitivity that uh, database entries has uh, is, is also something to consider. Uh, the other argument is that keys could be stored in a KMS. Uh, we can use KMS and not use anything in memory. But then what about the KMS credentials? Like where are they coming from? If somebody Again, can do the same thing, do memory dump. You don't even have to do memory dump. If you have access to the host, you can see at those secrets for those KMS. Um, and then, like, is the KMS backed by any uh, hardware, uh, like HSM or confidential compute hardware again? Like, you know, what about the KMS, KMS security? So, uh, yeah, uh, there are these bunch of uh, things to uh, think about. And uh, this, this talk primarily focuses on the server. Uh, what about the agents, right? Uh, like, do we need security for the agent? But then we like, don't assign so much importance to agents' uh, security because the, the blast radius is smaller. So 
yeah, uh, to, to, f to further uh, take this discussion forward, I will uh, invite Matt. Thanks. Yeah, it's great to see the demo. Um, so, we, the, so a couple of um, further improvements. I guess we realized that this um, gave us the opportunity to do a whole lot more, uh, given once we started exploring the opportunity together. So these are just some of the improvements we think um, we could propose in the respective projects. Um, so well, number one is uh, really adding plugin support. So Inspire has a great um, plugin system um, you know, for a variety of things, so for instance, for the data store, for the key managers. And so one thing to add here would be potentially plugin support for something like Azure SQL and, and other uh, vendor you know, um, you know, provided databases that have uh, confidential hardware. Um, so this would kind of get that, give that guarantee um, that the data store, the backspire, is also uh, protected uh, as well because you know, compromise of that could lead to workloads being uh, compromised as well, or at least the trust domain being compromised. Um, with Coco, the uh, config could also come from a KBS, so that's that, that key broker service, if you remember from the, from the diagram that I showed. Um, so, yeah, obviously we can make sure that we're also deriving it from a trusted uh, source, and that's gone through a process of attestation. Um, there is in the Spire project, it's worth noting, and we probably ought to include a link here, we will add it to the slides, in fact. Um, there is actually uh, a bunch of folks that have been working on a node tester uh, for SCV NEP, SNP. So that will effectively attest uh, that the Spire agent is running uh, on confidential compute hardware. Um, so that's something that is already in the project. It's, I think, experimental. Um, so yeah, we can provide a link to, to that just so um, you can find it later. Um, there is also scope, we realize, for a workload attester here as well. So you might remember earlier in the talk I was talking about workload attestation, um, you know, introspecting the Linux kernel or finding out information about the process. Um, you could also, in this particular case, you know, build a workload attester. Uh, and obviously there's a, there's a plugin system here, so you could go and build a plugin that's external to Spire itself um, that could do the process of like, verifying that the workload is running um, within Coco. So this, this would be a particularly I think, good component to go, to go build. I think this is probably something we might go do. Um, if anyone's interested, let us know. Um, and there's also, remember, if you remember from the Spire architecture, there's the server and the agents. Um, the agents themselves um, also um, have keys. They have keys for the workloads. Uh, the blast radius is more limited uh, intentionally. That's, that's in the, yeah, the Spire threat model. Um, so you, it only manages uh, the keys for the workloads that are running on the node itself. Um, but yeah, there's the opportunity, I believe, we believe, to sort of think about running the agents within the Enclave as well. Um, so this would be uh, probably a, a good opportunity to explore this uh, somewhat further as well. So yeah, this, this is right, great, hopefully a good opportunity to go ahead and sort of see how these projects can further uh, help uh, each other. So I think we're probably running long time, so just to kind of, um, you know, some takeaways uh, for you, and we're obviously happy to take some questions. Um, so Spiffy and Spire, we learned about Spiffy is the framework for providing identity uh, to software systems. Spire is the reference implementation. Uh, we learned a little bit about the Spire architecture, um, really at a high level, um, the Spire server, the agents and the workloads, and the need to protect the Spire server. Um, and yeah, obviously that, that the blast radius is yeah, significant. Uh, so it's important to protect it, run it on its own dedicated hardware. And we've seen that you know, we can use Cocoa in order to protect you know, memory when in use. Um, so the signing keys and the signing key operations can be protected uh, pretty much. Um, there is an opportunity for sort of some extra plugins. Um, so yeah, as I said, data store plugins, key store plugins um, that use confidential computing. That's something we'd like to explore. Um, and as I said, there's further opportunities for like more uh, attestation, yeah, you know, something like a per workload agent uh, is something that we believe um, could be in scope um, as well. So these were two open source projects, CNCF projects. Please, please get involved. Um, There's the links here to the respective projects and some, some documentation. We'll make the slides available. They've got lots of reference links. Um, so yeah, please find the slides uh, and uh, please let us know your feedback. So I think we may or may not have some time for questions, but thank you very much for being here. Feel free to ask, or we're here um, if you want to come and ask us more directly. Yeah, you can. You can come to the mic and ask questions. Yeah. Hi. Uh, um, we use enclaves as part of a managed offering, um, so we use Nitro enclaves. But I think the idea is the same, right? Just make sure what you're running is what you intend to be running. 
how do you deal with the problem of making sure what you put in the enclave is what you intended to put in the first place? So the security of getting to the point where you have an enclave at all. So uh, Nitro enclaves work, I think, a bit differently, where they ensure in software that the, the admin doesn't have access to the workload or VMs. With, uh, with confidential compute, it's guaranteed with the, with the, by the CPU or hardware. So what happens is in the attestation process, the evidence that is generated, it is signed by, uh, it is signed by the underlying hardware, right? Like uh, the CPU, pro, uh, AMD or Intel. And then when you verify it on the remote attestation on the other side, you see like the, uh, the hashes for those applications are those exactly what you wanted. And if anything is changed, you, you see in the attestation report that it has changed. Does that answer your question? I was worried more about the point where you get to, for example, you put Spire in the enclave. How do you know Spire is what you put in the enclave? So you need to know the hash in advance, right? Yeah. yeah. Also, one disclaimer, I, I suggested Azure SQL because not because I work for Microsoft, but because it's the only SQL server out there I found which runs on a confidential compute hardware. So we need more offerings, hosted offerings if people wanted, that are running in confidential compute hardware. No questions? I think we are out of time anyway. Cool. Uh, find us around here, and uh, thank you for attending. Have a good one.